Welcome everyone. This is a run through of ship and risk analysis in EVE Online. My name is Quinn Munba. I'm a fleet commander with Brave Collective. This video was live streamed for our members and has been re-uploaded for your use. It goes over the strengths and weaknesses of each class of ship in the game, and we have enabled chapters for quick access to specific sections due to its length. I hope you enjoy the video and happy hunting. So the first thing I actually wanted to cover was just the different sizes of the ship and how they're generally going to apply. So if you're looking at your ship tree, I've got one pulled up right here. Frigates are typically going to be your lowest DPS, damage per second. So they aren't going to have the same damage output, but they're small guns or smaller size missiles will be able to apply to basically anything in the game. It just won't do it for as much. Stepping up, you've got destroyers, which use the exact same weapon types, but have a little bit more tank. They basically specialize in killing frigates. There are a few niche things, like for example, uh, the Cormorant is actually really good if you have a bunch of them at killing anything from a ludicrous range and just bouncing around like crazy. Uh, once you get up to the cruisers, that's where you start to see a bit more specialization in the weapons. So they're going to have slightly higher damage than your frigates and destroyers. Uh, typically about twice as much, assuming you've got the equivalent skills trained. And they're going to start to lose application against frigates. They're almost useless against drones once the drones are on top of you while they're burning in because of transversal and stuff like that. They still work. And uh, with missile cruisers, they can actually still use light missiles like the frigates and destroyers can. It's just they have typically used rapid light missiles. So instead of firing bigger missiles, they'll fire more missiles if they're fit up for that. Then you've got the battle cruisers, which is kind of a similar situation to with cruisers as it is between frigates and destroyers. They're going to be bigger. They can fit more stuff. They can be tankier, but they use the same weapons. So they can apply to your frigates. But they won't do it as well because they don't have the bonuses that cruisers normally have to being able to do it. And they'll also be able to punch up towards battleship a lot easier than cruisers will. And then finally, at least in terms of subcapital holes, we get to the battleships. These are typically going to be your highest damage ships in the game. They're also typically going to be the tankiest ships in the game, at least in terms of subcaps. The problem is that they start to lose application. Um, if it's below a cruiser, without specific things that you do to help you apply better, you shouldn't try to shoot anything below a cruiser. Like webs, grapplers, things like that that are outside the scope of this video is what will allow you to shoot frigates and destroyers with them. But in so general... Can you, can you define grappler? Uh, a, a stasis grappler is... I'm assuming all of you guys know what a stasis webifier is. Um, it just makes your ship move slower, basically. A stasis grappler is the same thing, except it's a battleship-only module that has a much stronger effect when you're close to the ship. So at the extreme edge of the range of it, it will be less effective than a stasis webifier, but when you're right up against the other ship, it will be massively more powerful in the effect. So that, like I said, that's not really in the scope of this video. The, this is more looking at the ship type itself and deciding whether or not it's a good fight to take, so to speak. 
So that that's all the basic subcap. I'll cover cover the actual capitals later on. Just wanted to give a quick run through so that you guys understood application and what you're going to be more effective against. Uh, the next thing I wanted to cover. So if you if you look, there's this line right here that distinguishes where your Tech One ships are, and then all these branches up up to the top are Tech Two or in some cases Tech Three ships. And the main difference here is that they are going to have more bonuses. They will be much stronger in certain aspects. They'll have special modules that they can fit. And they also have different resistance profiles than the Tech 1 ships. So, for example, with Tech 1 ships, shields will always be weaker to EM and thermal damage than kinetic and explosive, and the reverse is true for armor. But, for example, with Minmatar T2 ships, if I go and pull up the attributes on the Munin, when you look at the shield resistances, it actually has a higher resistance to EM and thermal than it does to kinetic and explosive. And the reason for the specific resistances has to do with the lore of the game in terms of what factions fight what factions, but it's basically designed to counter a specific weapon type. Sorry, is that is that true for all Minotaur ships? All T2 Minotaur ships are going to have a higher EM thermal resistance than uh, the normal EM uh, resistant for shields? Okay. Yeah. So um, normally with shields, your base EM resistance is actually zero. Period. End of discussion for T1 ships. And that's also the same for basically every other faction. Here, Here's the Onyx, the, the Minmatar Heavy Interdiction Cruiser. Its shield resistance to EM is zero. However, it has a massive thermal resistance because Kaldari ships have the uh, kinetic thermal resistance buff on their shields. And I believe that Minmatar is actually weird. Nope, nope, it's just the shields. I couldn't remember for sure on that one. That's something you don't really think about, that Minmatar actually technically specializes in shield and armor. Okay. Next thing I want to do is start running through the different classes of T2 and T3 ships. Uh, before I do that, did anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? I guess we're good. I was just giving people a chance to type if they were typing into the stream, because I know some people just wanted to listen. Okay, so first thing we're going to cover is the Assault Frigate. And I'm, I'm going to try and pull up one that you'll be familiar with, because it's a Doctrine ship whenever we use it. So, for example, with the Assault Frigate, uh, the Harpy is an Assault Frigate. So the Assault Frigates are basically exceedingly tanky frigates with typically higher than normal DPS at the expense of any utility. They are designed to basically be the steel fist behind the boxing glove in terms of frigate fleets. So you're going to get honestly, cruiser-level tank when you fire up the Assault Damage Control, which is a special module that Assault Frigates and Heavy Assault Cruisers can use. Spikes your resistances up through the roof for a limited amount of time. And, for example, with the Harpy, you get 5% bonus per level to the damage, and the Harpy's a bit weird. It gets a double optimal range bonus. Um, that's why it, even though it's a frigate, it's actually viable as a long-range ship. 
and that's how we use them. We used to use them is with rails. We currently use them with blasters because the that dank DPS. Uh, next thing is the electronic attack ships. So we don't have any of these as doctrine, but we have their T1 variant as doctrine. And that's actually something I wanted to cover. So with every T2 ship, the T1 base model for it will have some similar bonus. So for example, with Kaldari, the Griffin is a T1 ship and gets some pretty dank bonuses to ECM or jams. And when you go and look at the electronic attack ship, it gets those same bonuses, although I believe it's actually at a higher level, plus some additional bonuses tied to the electronic attack ship's bonus. Uh, same thing goes for Amar ships, another really common E-War ship to see flown in our fleets is the Crucifier. It's an amazing weapon disruption platform. If you have Amar, Cru Amar Frigate 5, you get 50% bonus to the range, and I don't want to do the math in my head, but it's a hefty bonus to how strong each weapon disruptor is. And then when you go out to the Sentinel, which is the electronic attack ship for Amar, you get that same seven and a half bonus to the effectiveness per level, but then you also add neutralization to it. And the, um, what you'll find is that any E-War specialty ships are basically shared across the entire faction. So for Amar, it's going to be neutralizers and weapon disruption. For Kaldari, it's just jams, just all the jams. Uh, Galente is going to be points, scrams, and sensor dampeners. Uh, for those of you who might not know what sensor dampeners are, since they're a bit less commonly used, it allows you to reduce the targeting range, the lock time, or both of an enemy ship. And with Minmatar ships, it's webs and target painters. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, what, what did you say the Sentinel does? Uh, Sentinel, it's weapon disruption and neutralizers and Nosferatu's. Uh, basically, the Amar E War ships are going to interfere with your ability to use your weapons, and they're going to directly attack your capacitor. Good. Nosferatu's are a bit complicated, but long story short, both them and neutralizers are going to reduce the amount of capacitor that is currently available for you to use. Anything else? Okay. Um, next type of T2 frigate is going to be your covert ops ships. And for every single faction, there are two of them with completely different specialties. It's not like the interceptors and the assault frigates where they're very similar. It's completely different. So the first one is your covert ops frigate, like proper covert ops frigate. What they're going to, uh, with all covert ops ships, they're going to be able to use what's called a covert ops cloak, which means that they can warp while cloaked. So unless you get lucky, long story short, the only times you will ever see them in your system is when they jump in, jump out, or are shooting at you. So the covert ops frigates specialize in scanning 
Uh, the anathema is a little weird in that it has a rocket damage. I don't think the... No, they do actually have damage bonuses. I'm sorry. Long story short, they're useful for almost nothing but scanning down wormholes. So I didn't even remember that they had it. Uh, they also get bonuses to relic and data analyzers. So they're, they're basically explode ships. Uh, the other type of covert ops frigate is the stealth bomber. And these are basically the one exception to how ships are designed to apply. The stealth bomber is designed almost exclusively to apply to battleships and capitals. They use torpedoes, which is a short-range maximum damage missile. And they also have the ability to use a bomb launcher, which is one of, I believe, four, four, one of three true AOE weapons remaining in the game. Uh, you've got your stealth bomber bombs and your structure bombs. I'm counting those as one. You've got your Titan du bosons and you've got uh, the point defense system on Forzars, Hasbells, Tataras, etc. So can these. I make, can I make a quick note about bombs? Yeah, go for it. Sure. So they're not actually targeted weapons. So you have to be going in the direction that you want the bomb to go, and it'll explode yes. 30 kilometers from where you launch it. Yes, 100%. Wasn't going to bring it up because, once again, kind of out of stuff for this video. I, I but yes, um, stealth bomber bombs are untargeted weapons. They're fire and forget. They go 30 kilometers in front of you, go boom, 15 kilometer radius. Anything in that radius takes damage. Friend, foe, yourself does not matter. And yes, you can kill yourself with your own bomb. It has been done. Uh, next, if, does anyone have any questions about the Covert Ops Frigate? Okay. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't recommend, um, using a, uh, Covert Ops Frigate for scanning down, uh, ships at safes, would you? 100% I would. Just not the self bomber, the actual proper covert ops frigate. So that's going to be the buzzard, the anathema, the helios, or the cheetah. If you, however, um, kind of off topic, but you brought it up. Um, the astero, if your skills in covert ops frigates are low, is actually going to be a better platform. Uh, you have to hit, I think it's Covert Ops 3 or 4 before you start to get better probe results with a Covert Ops frigate than you do with an Astero, due to the fact that it's skill-based with the Cove Ops, it's a roll bonus with the Astero. Meaning that it's fixed as opposed to you have to train the skill for it to get better. Um, is this lecture going to be like recorded and uploaded? At a later date. Yeah, I'm, I'm recording it and streaming it. So it, I will definitely send it over to Jinx. Okay, thanks. I might have to, like, be AFK for in, um, in the middle of it. Oh, yeah, that that's not a problem. And uh, I believe I also have my Twitch set to save it, so it should be available for, like, two or three days after this as well on Twitch. Uh, next one is... The interceptors. So most times when you see an interceptor, it's going to be what's called a fleet interceptor. So that's going to be the stiletto, malediction, Ares, or the crow. The main reason you see these is they are interdiction nullified which means that 
basically they ignore bubbles. They fly straight through them. Uh, it's one of the few ships that you can fly around Nullsec with relative impunity. The other distinguishing features of this type of ship, they are exceedingly good at being fast casual. They're all going to get this 5% bonus, so Warp Scrambler and Warp Disruptor optimal range, and this reduction in their Micro Warp Drive Signature Radius penalty. So what that means is that they are ludicrously fast in the first place. They are going to be harder to lock than anything else on the field. And they're also going to be able to tackle you from further out than almost anything else on the field. However, if they even have weapons fit, they do dog shit for damage. So their prime, the primary risk from a fleet interceptor is, is just simply being stuck where you are. Because... It's going to tackle you, it's going to be hard for you to kill, and then their buddies are going to show up and do the killing for the guy piloting the interceptor. The flip side of that is the combat interceptors. So these still get the micro warp drive signature penalty reduction, but they will get better damage bonuses, and they'll get a they aren't nullified anymore. And they also don't get the range bonus. So they're a bit more dangerous, especially in large numbers. Um, some groups used to run around with what was called the sword fleet. So it was just a whole bunch of interceptors with high alpha, long range weapons. And they, they were all these combat interceptors, not the fleet ones, because they actually get the bonus to it. And what they would do is they would warp in, lock someone up, volley them off the field, because it was used almost exclusively against frigates and destroyers, so it was low enough health that you could do it with 20 or 30 guys. And then they would all get fleet warped off two seconds after they land, and the target would be dead. So, long story short, if they don't have friends, and if you can catch them, go after the scepter. Great, fantastic, have fun. Uh, last type of frigate that we haven't covered is the logistics frigate. These things are effectively useless on their own. They can't rep themselves worth shit. They don't have buffer. They have no DPS output to speak of. What they do is they keep their friends alive. So if you only see one of these, it will be the easiest kill you've ever had. If you see two of them, good luck. Because they will be working to actively keep each other alive. What's up, Wyvern? I saw you mic up. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, it's one of my keys. I apologize. Not a problem. Ignore me. I, I was basically done with the logistic frigates anyway, so it was question time. Um, one thing I forgot to point out, uh, the logistics frigates and the logistics cruisers are basically the same thing, but on different size platforms. So the logistics cruisers, the Basilisk, the Guardian, the Oniros, and the Scimitar are basically bigger, beefier versions of it. So, on their own, they're next to useless, but with buddies, they're going to be even harder to kill than the logistics frigates, because they also rep a lot more than the logistics frigates. And it's the same thing with the electronic attack ships and the recon, with one exception. Two exceptions, I'm sorry. So, there are two types of recons. There's the Force Recons and the Combat Recons. And you can tell them apart by the roll bonuses. The Combat Recons 
you can't see them on DSCAN. So you will never see them if you're trying to take a DSCAN of a fleet to send information to the FT. These won't show up on it. And the biggest issue with that is typically the Hugin. Um, it has massively long-ranged webs, gets used by everybody it for basically everything, and you have to manually count them and add it to the information. The other one for each faction is going to be a forced recon. And that's going to be able to use a covert ops cloak. It's going to be able to light a sino and bring its friends in on top of you as well. And it's, both of these are still going to have the same E-War bonuses that the electronic attack ship will. Any questions? Okay, cool. Yeah, can you briefly go over um, what that means to Sino? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, long story short, um, if, you, if you see a sinusoidal field, that basically means that someone is creating a beacon that other ships are able to use their jump drive to access. So there are a couple different types, but long story short, if you see one go up, other than an industrial sino, it means that someone is going to bring, be bringing some of their friends through. Now, whether it's just someone moving or whether you're getting dropped on, all depends on whether or not the target's blue. So when you catch a Titan bridge, that's a Titan shooting people using its bridge module to a Sino somewhere in space. Same thing goes with Black Ops Battleship. Um, capitals can also jump to them directly. Any other questions? Next thing is Command Destroyers. So Command Destroyers have two primary distinguishing features. For one, they're the smallest ship in the game that is able to mount Lynx. Uh, Lynx is a fleet assistance module, is how the game classifies them. What they do is based on the skills of the pilot that is has it mounted on their ship when they're active anyone within a certain radius will get a bonus to some aspect of their ship and it's tied to what faction the ship is as to what the bonuses are you can mount any link on any command destroyer but you want to tie it to the bonuses, because otherwise it's kind of waste. So, for example, whenever you go on a fleet and you see these little bubbles show up right above your heads-up display, that means that someone is firing off their links. So you could be getting more shield hit points, better resistances, they could be improving the ability of your logistics ship to repair you. They could be improving your speed, your maneuverability, how far your tackle goes. There's a lot of different things that it can do. However, on their own, command destroyers typically aren't that big of a threat because they're primarily a... They're primarily an assistant, a fleet assistance ship. Um, the one thing that they can do on their own is 
they have what's called a micro jump field generator. If you've heard people talking about getting boosted, that's what they're referring to. Uh, what this does, anything within six kilometers of the ship when the cycle ends, gets shoved a hundred kilometers through space in the direction that the command destroyer was pointing. There are a few exceptions in terms of what can go through. Um, long story short, if you're in a subcapital, you can be boosted. The exceptions are only with bigger ships. Any questions about command destroyers? Okay. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Um, so with the T1 destroyers, they have more tanks than frigates, but not a lot more. The command destroyers and the T3Cs are the exception to that. They can get extremely tanky, extremely fast. So you typically can kill them solo, but it'll take a bit of work. Uh, next thing I want to cover is interdictors. These are the ships that you see launching bubbles in space and running away. Um, in fleets, that's typically all they do. They either cloak up somewhere and wait for someone to be dumb, or they're just throwing bubbles out left and right and running away because they're an easy target. Uh, the flip side of that is if it's just you, The people who fly these in small gangs or solo are very good with them. They will typically have a warp scrambler. They will typically do 200 plus DPS. So that they're doing really good DPS for the size ship they're in. They're doing what would be considered decent for a T1 cruiser on a destroyer platform. Uh, the one thing is that they inherit the relative lack of tank from the t1 destroyers so if you can get a good amount of damage into them they'll die quickly but you have to get that damage in because they're getting that same damage into you any questions about dictors okay uh next thing is the tactical destroyers so these are an interesting type of ship. Uh, they're actually our first Tech 3 ship. I'm not going to get into the production of them or anything like that because it's, it's a headache, to say the least. But these are the absolute best you can get a destroyer to be. They're going to have the highest tank. They're typically going to have very high speed, very low SIG radiuses, which means you won't be able to track them very well. And they're going to have the highest DPS. So if you look right here on the side of my simulated window here, they have different modes. And you can only change them every so often. But... They're all going to have a defense mode, a sharpshooter mode, and a propulsion mode. If you're shooting at them and they're smart, they'll flip it into defense mode. All of a sudden, they're going to have much higher resistances than they normally would with the same amount of raw hit points, which means you have to work harder to get them dead. And their SIG radius is also going to shrink. Sharpshooter mode is going to cause them to shoot more bullets further, basically. And they're also going to hurt more when they do. And what, one thing you'll notice with the T3Ds, when you switch modes, there's actually a um, change to the model. So if you really want to put the time in, you can actually learn to recognize what mode they're in and act accordingly. 
Um, oh, and I, I forgot to mention propulsion mode. It makes them go faster and align faster. Uh, the Hikade, the Galente one, can actually warp faster than basically anything in the game can lock it in propulsion mode, assuming that it doesn't have a bunch of armor plates or something on it. Long story short, you don't want to try and solo a T3D, and they're absolutely devastating in numbers. Any questions? So we, we trained the Kaldari Tech 3, right? So if we're looking to yes. train to a T3, it would be best to go for the Jackdaw just to start with? Correct. Uh, the Jackdaw is the one we actually use for fleets. Um, so there's kind of a thing with T3Ds. It, it's kind of a sliding scale. So in general, the Jackdaw is great in fleets, but it's not going to be as good solo. Uh, the Galente and Amara ones, the Hikade and the Confessor, can be used either way. The Mimitar one is almost exclusively going to be flown by solo pilots or small guys. Uh, give me two seconds to grab a drink, guys. My throat's getting a little dry. Are you guys falling pretty well? Yep. Do a lot there. Sorry, what was that crash? There's a lot there, a lot of information. Oh, yeah. And I, I've been playing the game for four years now, almost. Um, I've, I'm have i actually in a unique situation where I've been FCing basically since day one. Um, it's a story I can tell later. But um, basically, I learned how to do this analysis and by doing that it, it allows me to basically look at a situation look at the numbers and instantly know whether or not i can take the fight and it, it's a useful skill to have regardless of whether you're an fc you're just going out solo trying to kill some guys and have fun or if you're going out with five other guys in a kaiji nano gang you need to know what they're bringing, what the risk factor is. So even after I'm done walking you through the different ship types and everything I'm going to cover, I heavily recommend that you guys spend some time going through the ship tree, looking at what ships have what bonus. Uh, there, there are actually a lot of faction ships that I'm not going to explicitly cover because they do fall within the generalizations that are exceedingly risky to go up against. Like, I'm, I'm going to explicitly cover the Brutix Navy issue, but, for example, the Osprey Navy issue is very risky to go up against without a lot of people helping you. So just make sure you go... You, you can even go and use uh, Z Killboard. If you guys have heard of it, I'm assuming you have. Uh, you can go and look at what ship types are getting the most kills. And then go and look at the ship tree, see what their bonuses are. See how some what some of the fits are from the ones who died. And try to figure out what makes them so good. And that will make you operate at a much higher level and be able to analyze things on the fly a lot easier. Any questions before I continue on? Okay. So... The next thing I'm going to cover is the heavy assault cruisers. Uh, this is another one of those where there's typically one that's focused more towards being used in a fleet and one that's typically more 
focus towards being used solo in a small game. And there isn't really an obvious difference in the bonuses, but basically just look at the doctrines that people fly, and that'll help tell you which one's which. Because the one that actually gets flown from each race will typically be the fleet-focused one as opposed to the small gang one. You see Munin fleets all the time, but you aren't really seeing Vagabond fleet. If you catch my drift. What these are going to do, um, they have the ability to fit the assault damage control that I mentioned with the assault frigate that spikes your resistances for, I believe it's 13 to 15 seconds, depending on which one you have fitted. And they're also going to be exceptionally tanky and have typically very high DPS. So I'm actually going to flip scenes real quick. Here we go. Just as an example, I'm going to pull up our Munin fit and load some ammo. Okay, I was right. So, for example, with the Munin, and I, I haven't trained Heavy Assault Cruisers up to the max. I've only got it to, I believe, level 3. And I'm still showing almost 400 DPS with a long-range weapon. Uh, typically, the longer the range, the lower the DPS. So if I were to, for example, unmount all these guns and switch it to auto cannons, which is the shorter range, higher DPS version for Mimitar, that number would be a lot higher. It would probably be five to 600 DPS easy. So, so just, just kind of an offhand question, but if you're looking to kind of, you know, join up in a, in a response fleet or go out on your own, would it make sense to mix um, different types of turrets? Or do you typically want to just fly your ship with one type of turret? No, you are always going to want to fly your ship with one type of turret. Um, I mean, you, you could theoretically just so that way you can engage at basically any range. But you basically wind up gaining the ability to engage at any range at the expense of being able to engage well at any range. If that makes sense. You'll be a lot more effective, for example, with a short-range weapon if you take the couple hits while you burn in to use your weapons at short range than if you give up half your turrets to mount longer-range weapons that you can use on the way in. So when, when taking a ship and fitting a ship, it's important to think of the, the strategy and kind of where you're going to be flying it in relation to the opponent. That way you can you know, focus exactly. on specializing. Exactly. So if you have something that's got short-range weapons, for example, if you've got something with pulse lasers for a MAR, you're typically going to want to fit a web and or like a scram or a point. Because you're going to be up close and personal, you want to stay up close and personal and keep them from running away. Because if they run away, all of a sudden your guns can't hit them anymore. But if, for example, you're in a Munin, which for our Doctrine fit uses artillery cannons, which are a very long-ranged weapon, you aren't going to want to fit those points and scrams and webs, you're going to want to fit a bunch of tank and go really fast. So that way you're running away, shooting at them while they ch try to chase you. Any other questions so far? Um, is there like some kind of metric where like I can kind of expect how much DPS each um, ship class is? typically does. 
Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So obviously, especially with the T twos, you're going to see a lot of variation. Like for example, um, most of the recons don't do much damage, but if you look at the curse, it uses drones, and it's got a good drone bonus. It's actually got it's actually tied for the best drone damage bonus in the game with the Pilgrim, the Arbitrator, and the different Vexers and the Ishtar. You you don't get a drone bonus a drone damage bonus over 10% in the game. So I've got a curse sitting in my hangar in Saging that does over 350 DPS while still having the massive E War bonuses and an absolutely ludicrous amount of tank for recon that is combat capable. Admittedly, the the Falcon, the one we normally use for Sinos, that one can get a hell of a lot tankier than the Curse can, but that's also at the expense of all of its E War capability that is strictly so that way it can survive longer while lighting a Sino. So, with that caveat, uh, your frigates aren't really ever going to get above, your T1 frigates aren't really ever going to get above probably 150 DPS. Uh, your T1 destroyers probably won't really ever get above 300. And they're typically going to have about twice the tank of the frigate. Just uh, your, Sorry, go ahead. One more question regarding recon ships. Um, are recon ships still great ships to fly uh, solo or in no sec or low sec? Oh, even if absolutely. you're not really relying on, you know, sinos. Oh yeah, absolutely. None of that capability has been removed. They just picked recons as one of the few ships that were still able to light sinos after the change. Like, uh, for example, right here in my hangar in T Taxi, I have both a Pilgrim and. Okay, I lied. My ult is currently holding my curse because I uh, used it to go po Poco bashing a week ago and forgot to hand it back. So I can't show you the tank and the ludicrous range and all that stuff unless I've got a fit saved, which I think I do. That's the wrong button. <laughs> I've got a I've got a few fits saved. So for example, this right here is an armor fit curse. Um my personal one is actually shield. If you notice, it's got a lot of mid slots. So it's actually really good at shield tanking, which is rare for an Amar ship. But I'll get into that later. But if you notice, if you look at the range on all these newts and nosses, they're really long range. You get a 40% bonus to their range per level. And I happen to have Recon 5. So this is literally the highest number you will see on whatever specific module. On top of that, um, it still has the bonuses from the electronic attack ship. It still has that 7.5% to weapon disruptor. And it has a bonus to the drone damage. So... In this case, it doesn't have any damage modifiers because the low slots are all filled with tank due to it being an armor tank ship, but you're still seeing 250 DPS, which is not bad at all for just flapping guns on something, so to speak. They're exceedingly fun and exceedingly lethal if they're underestimated. Any questions? It's just kind of a, 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 a spark notes, cliff notes. Um, the, you'd say that the main thing to pay attention to when fitting a ship is 
paying attention to the bonuses as kind of a guide? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, also, even just try, like, if you see something on Intel or someone says that there's this type of ship jumping in, like, for example, if someone says that there's an heiress jumping in to staging and they want to go kill it, well, in this case, the heiress is the Galente Interdictor. So it is going to have an absolutely massive amount of DPS or an absolutely massive range. I'll get into hybrid weapons later, but long story short, those are your options. Some of the highest DPS in the game or some of the longest range in the game. It's going to be able to bubble. It's going to be fast. And it's going to be hard to hit. So a perfect thing to take it on would be something like an assault frigate or possibly a tanky cruiser that it will think looks yummy, so to speak. Okay. However, on the flip side, you can actually, you can also look at those bonuses and figure out how to fit it for yourself. So, for example, it gets a reduction in the armor plate mass penalty. That means that you can get it tankier without losing speed. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to check stream chat. Uh, Spank, the bombers, they apply okay to barges. Uh, the torpedoes have a pretty steep fall off in terms of how well they apply once you get below battle cruiser holes. But the mining barges are kind of halfway in between there and cruisers in terms of their sig radius, and they're slow. So yes, they do apply. Um, Captain, I'm assuming you're talking about faction warfare. Um, that's entirely up to you, my man. Um, I You can make some good money by getting the LP and flipping it and doing all sorts of stuff. But I don't personally do it, so I can't speak to what the true risk reward is. Um, I could probably find someone, if you want, who you can talk to who can give you better input on it. Any other questions so far? Okay. So, next thing I'm going to talk about is the heavy interdiction cruisers. Uh, this is basically the big brother to the dictors. The main differences, other than the fact that it's a cruiser, meaning that it can be a lot tankier, but also slower is that it's not a warp disrupt probe launcher like on the Dictor. The bubble will always be centered on the ship. Um, the other main difference is that the bubble module on the cruiser can use grip. So you can shut it down, load a script into it, and all of a sudden, instead of creating a bubble around you that nothing can warp out of, it can go and warp disrupt someone to the point that literally nothing can warp while that's active, or it can scram something to that same point. It's just the choice of what range do you want, and whether you not whether or not you want to shut down their micro jump drives and micro warp drives, which a scram script would do at the expense of the range. The other main thing to know about heavy interdiction, well, there's two things. Uh, for one, they typically don't have guns unless you're talking about like high-spec pirates, like war deckers and whatnot. 
uh, if you run into a war decker in high sec and they're flying a heavy interdiction cruiser, it will typically have guns on it because they will just infinite point you and then burn you down slowly. Uh, occasionally they'll have friends come in, sometimes they won't. But in null sec, you won't typically won't see them with guns <clears throat> because you'll typically see them with a whole bunch of friends that have bigger guns than they can carry. So they'll focus on other things that make their ship more effective, like extra tank, like a little bit of extra speed, having multiple bubbles so that way you can have a bubble up and have a script loaded. Um, I can actually show you uh, my heavy interdiction cruiser. So uh, I fly the Amar one, which is the Devoter, is the one that I prefer to fly. And I don't even have the implants that I normally run in it in, and I've still got as much EHP as a heavy assault cruiser typically would while it has its assault damage control active. They are exceptionally tanky if you fit them up right. And on top of that, if you notice, I have two bubble modules. That's so that way, like I said, I can have one up in a bubble mode, trapping everyone within the radius. And I can also have a script loaded into the other one, so that way I can scram them, or if they're just outside the bubble, I can have the warp disruption one loaded, and that actually reaches out past where the bubble would. Just, just a really quick side tangent. Can you explain the difference between a, dis a warp disruptor and a warp scrambler? I did a minute ago, but I can go over it again. So oh, both sorry. of them are tackle modules, and with regards to me saying loading the disruption script or the scram script, these basically, if you load the script into it, function as super beefed up warp disruptors or warp scramblers. They both do the same thing in that they prevent things from warping off with caveat with the, for the normal modules without caveat for the scripted hick bubble. The main difference is that the scram is shorter ranged and will also shut off any micro warp drives or micro jump drives on the ship that is being used on. So, <clears throat> the other thing to know about the heavy interdiction cruisers. While they have their bubble up, scripted, not scripted, doesn't matter. They can't receive remote rent. Logi will not be able to apply until they take that bubble down. So if they have their bubble up, you want to pound them for everything it's worth to see if you can break them before before they can get the bubble back down to get reps. And if you pound them hard enough, they will panic, they will take it down, and you will be able to get away. Any questions about Hicks? Okay, moving on then. Next thing to cover is strategic cruisers. So I'm not going to cover a lot with them. I'm not going to go anywhere near as in-depth as the others. Because there's basically one lesson to learn when it comes to T3Cs and how much of a threat they are to you. The answer is, if you are scared of any cruiser, this is the one you should be scared of. Period. End of discussion. They are some of the tankiest, highest DPS ships that you can find. And they're also 
so versatile and so specializable that it is absolutely ludicrous. Not to mention the fact that they're also one of the ships in the game that can light a covert sino and bring a whole bunch of bombers or recons or other things right on top of you in two seconds flat. And they've got enough tank that when they do that, you won't be able to kill them before their friends and them because they can do 500 plus DPS if you've got them fit right kill you. Any questions? Is there a reason like why the strategic cruisers are so popular? Because I see them like very, very, very often. They're, they're so popular because they're so good. Uh, they're really they're really high skill point ships and they're the only type of ship in the game that you can lose skill points while flying anymore. Um, it it used to be that if you didn't update your um, death clone every so often, you would lose skill points if you died above wherever you had last updated it to. But with the T3Cs, you will actually lose skill points if you die in it, period, end of discussion. Like, if but you get your ship blown up? Or... Yeah, yeah. If if you get your ship oh, blown sure. up, you're losing skill points. Uh in the subsystem skills to be specific. So uh give me two seconds. So it will always come from specifically the faction you're flying. So if I'm in a legion, for example, and I die, I will lose a level from one of these four skills right here. And each one of these corresponds to one of these subsystems that you can plug into a T3C that specializes it. And that's why they're so popular is because they're so customizable due to those subsystems. You can swap a subsystem out and all of a sudden the ship behaves completely differently, has completely different bonuses, etc. I mean, for crying out loud, I have a Loki that I use for my alt that it is basically just a taxi with a cyano strapped to it and some rapid light missiles for defense. But I can also change it around and all of a sudden it, it's a 50, 60,000 EHP brick to throw at somebody. Good luck killing me before my friends kill you. Now, rigs you lose when you take out a ship. Subsystems, do you not lose? Oh, no, hold on. So, if you if you die in a T3C, it's just like if you lose any other ship, but you lose one level of one of your subsystem skills. You never lose the actual faction strategic cruiser skill. You never lose any of the support skills. It's only those subsystem skills that you can lose. However, you do have to have those skills trained to be able to fly the ship. It's a prerequisite to sit in it, because you have to have all four subsystems in there, and you can't put that subsystem in if the skill you have in it is zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess my question was, if you have a uh, T3C and you unfit a subsystem, can you refit it? Or does it go away like Oh yeah, no 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 no. You can you can unfit a subsystem, but technically you have to repackage the entire ship to pull them out, or like put the new one in, which dumps the old one out. You can't actually remove it without okay. breaking down the entire ship. But you can hot swap them no problem. And because of the fact that you can break the entire ship down. T3Cs are also the only ship in the game that you can remove rigs from without destroying them. Fun fact. Oh. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, next thing we're going to cover then is the T1 battle cruisers.
we already went over them a little bit. There's one specific distinction I want to point out. For every faction, there are two different types of battle cruiser. Three hulls, but two different types. There's attack and combat battle cruisers. So I'm going to pull up Minmatar because we actually use all three of these in fleets. It's just how prevalent they are. So the two on the left are going to be your combat battle cruisers. These are going to actually have tanks. They're going to have some ability to apply a DPS. But their main excuse me, sorry. Their main distinguishing trait is the fact that they can take a hit. You're going to get much higher health in a combat battle cruiser than you will in a cruiser. The flip side of that coin is the attack battle cruisers. And that's going to be the one on the far right of your ship tree. These are going to do an absolutely ludicrous amount of damage. And almost every, actually no, every single one of them also has the ability to do comparable damage to the combat battle cruisers at a ludicrous range. Uh, basically, the way battle cruisers come down, you've got two that the, the combat battle cruisers are getting close to battleship tank while not quite having the DPS, whereas the attack battle cruiser has the battleship DPS in full, but it actually has less tank than a cruiser. Any questions on that? But what are some various roles that attack battle cruisers might serve? Okay, so attack battle cruisers actually only really have like three roles that I can think of. One of them is sniping. Like, uh, I'm assuming. Since we left GE, but we used to have an issue <clears throat> with uh, gangs of tornadoes coming through regularly, and they would land 150, 200, 250 kilometers off of someone, and they would all quickly lock that target, fire, they would die, and they would warp somewhere else. Uh, attack battle cruisers um, can also just be fed up for an absolute shitload of DPS and sit on top of something that can't shoot back, like a Poco or a Poss Tower or a ungunned structure and burn it down much faster than almost anything else in the game would be able to. Uh, the... Excuse me. Uh... The third thing that I could think of off the top of my head is actually an extension of that, and that's ganking um, in high sec. Uh, that's almost exclusively done with Palos's because they can get the highest DPS due to blasters, which we'll get into later. Any other questions on battle cruisers? Okay, so next thing I want to get into is the command ships. That's the Tech 2 battle cruisers. So CC, it used to be that there wasn't really a distinct bonus and difference in the role bonuses and the skill bonuses between the two for each faction, but CCP actually just changed that. Uh, believe it was 
like in January or February or late last year, somewhere in that time frame. So every faction now has one command ship that is ludicrously tanky. Like has a four percent bonus per level of Minmatar battle cruiser to resistances, but the bonus to their links isn't quite as good. And then they have one that's a lot more combat capable with lower tank and higher links in terms of the bonus. So, for example, you can get better, you can get a higher bonus to your shield hit points with a Splepnir than you can with a Claymore. How, and the Slepnir is also going to do a lot more damage than the Claymore. But the Claymore will typically have 20 to 30% more tank than the Slepnir does. So, um, going back to the root purpose of this class, the Claymore is the one that's easier to kill, assuming all of its friends are gone. But the Slepnir is the one you're more likely to wind up facing without a bunch of friends around. Make sense? Um, yeah. Would command ships be like decent to fly for PvP in like solo or small games? Okay, so I, I guess I wasn't specific enough. Uh, when you look at the command ship in the ship tree, the one with the 3% bonus to insert types of links, burst strength and duration, in the case of Minmatar, it's shield and skirmish. Those are going to be flown in fleet situations, almost exclusively. The one with the 4% bonus, you will sometimes see in a fleet because they want that higher bonus that higher level of links, but it's going to be a lot easier to kill. And you're also a lot more likely to see it in small gangs because they are more lethal. They have the higher damage bonuses. Their links are more effective for that slight edge over what you what they're going up against in terms of defenders. You're a lot more likely to see a Slepnir or one of the equivalents than a Claymore in a defensive situation in which you are not forming a full fleet. Any other questions about the command ships? What are the best um, command ships for our standing fleet? I'm sorry? Uh, which, if we chose to fly command ships, what would be optimal for our for standing fleet, um, yes. none of them. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. Um, so the Slepnir, for example, is a T2 version of the Hurricane. It does get slightly higher bonuses in terms of the damage, but you also lose a turret slot. So you can get comparable damage to the Slepnir with a Hurricane. You can get comparable tank to the Slepnir with the Hurricane. You can get, I think, actually better speed with a hurricane than a slept near. And we standing fleet is never organized enough to actually have like the logi you need to keep a juicy target like a command ship alive. So even if you want to bring links, battle cruisers as a whole can fit links. Any single battle cruiser platform can use command burst. Except sorry, the combat battle cruisers can, not the attack. I'm sorry. So if you if you want a battle cruiser for standing fleet, if you like the hurricane, don't go for the Slepnir, go for the hurricane. If you want something that's a bit tankier with a bit less combat capability, don't go for a Claymore. Just go for a Cyclone. For actual fleets, yes, for the love of God, bring command ship. You've got the infrastructure to keep them alive, at least in larger fleets. Any other questions? Um, 
I just had another question pop in my mind. I guess it applies to like all types of chips, but you know, like how there's like more among expensive types of model modules. Yep. So like, if you take, if you compare them one by one, it doesn't seem like it gives that much of a advantage over using like the tier two variants. But like, how much effective? How much are they more effective if you like? like tear up your modules to a more expensive point? Uh, honestly, once you get above the T2, um, you don't get that much return for your money. Um, diminishing returns is a huge thing in this game. If you fit too many of one type of module, all of a sudden all of them become less effective. Same thing goes for throwing more isk at your modules. You, as you get that next little percent, the price will start to exponentially climb. So, the the main reason that people will get into putting faction stuff on their ship is that it's as good or slightly better than T two, but the Fitting cost is lower, so it'll use less power grid or less CPU or both, and it becomes easier to fit more stuff on your ship. And that's where the real benefit of them comes in, at least at the low level, is just being able to cram more of them on without having to make compromises. Any other questions? Okay, so <clears throat> next thing I want to get into, and you aren't very likely to see these roaming around at all. Uh, you're most likely to see these if you are out on a roam and you find someone ratting in one, is Marauders. So these are going to be, full stop, the tankiest sub-capital ships you will ever find. Um, most of the time, they're active tanks as opposed to buffer, though. They're going to have relatively ludicrous amounts of damage output. Um, they're really slow, but they do fit a micro-jump drive, just like any other battleship, any other battle cruiser in the game. But they can fire it off a lot faster than other ships. So you, there's an actual chance that you could lose a race to a bass. Uh, yeah, Mar Marauders would be absolutely ludicrous for an ESS. I didn't even think about that, but just because of how heavily they can tank. It, it would be ridiculous. Um, uh, okay, um, Hero, yes, it, it is definitely risky. Um, throw that juicy of a target out there somewhere, and next thing you know, you'll have half a dozen hicks and a couple of dreads on top of you in two seconds flat. Anyways, um, the thing about Marauders is that it's, it's like Dreadnought. There is a module that you toggle that cuts your speed to zero and cranks everything else about your ship to 11. So when you hit the Bastion module, there is a visible change on your ship I am actually sitting in my paladin right now so with the paladin for example this little bit down here will actually extend and this blue stuff in the middle will start glowing and that's the visual tell for the paladin but there will be a visual tell just like with dreadnoughts going into siege their speed will drop to zero, and all of a sudden their tracking 
improves, their damage output improves, their ability to repair themselves improves, and just like a hit whose bubble is up, or a Dreadnought in Siege, they stop being able to be um, remote repaired, and just like a Dreadnought in Siege, you basically stop being able to jam them or apply E-War to them. Any questions? Okay, then. So, do, do Marauders make any sense for PvP? Offensively, no. Defensively, yes. Cool. So, uh, with my Paladin, uh, let me flip the scene real quick. So, if you notice, I have T2 guns. Yes, the Scorch Crystals are just about dead. I was ratting in it. Big one. Anyways. So, if you look outside of Bastion, even with the short range guns, I'm shooting out to 61 kilometers. And the tracking's okay for a battleship. It's 3.8. If I click this module and turn it on, all of a sudden, I become two to three times harder to kill. And all of a sudden, my zone of control is almost 100 kilometers around. Um, marauders are basically the equivalent of planting a machine gun in the middle of a field and screaming at people to come and get stuff. Okay, any other questions about Marauders before I move on? Think we're good? Oh, and by the way, that comment about Marauders basically being the equivalent of planting a machine gun in the middle of an open field, that's why Spank was saying in the stream chat that they're the king of the ESS. You can literally control that entire grid from the middle of it. But you also sacrifice your boom to escape. Once you it, exactly, the exactly. But at the same time, you're, you're able to self-rep so much that... So he, here's an example. Um, with my Paladin... I can warp in at zero on a haven and just bastion up there, load con flag, which is the high damage uh, pulse crystal. And I can just sit there and take all the damage that the site can throw at me while I murder everything in it. And it doesn't make an effect. I've still got more tank to give. I'm not even running my repair module nonstop. I don't have to take any drugs, nothing. I just sit there, I cycle it every 10 to 15 seconds, single cycle, and I'm staying above 70% armor fat full time. Anyways, moving on. So the next thing is Black Ops battleships. Uh, these, yes, hero, the Marauder is definitely capable of killing noobs. I'm happy to demonstrate if you'd like. Obviously, I'm kidding, but not by much. Anyways, um. So the Black Ops battleships are the only subcapital ship with a jump drive. Uh, what that means is that someone in another system 
can light a sino for you, and you basically skip every gate in between. You go straight from where you are to where they are, assuming that it's within range. And so, <clears throat> the other thing about these ships, they don't have the best tank, typically. There are exceptions, but they typically aren't going to have the highest tank. They are going to have absolutely massive amounts of DPS most of the time. Uh, these are 100% ambush ships. They're designed to operate with stealth bombers and recons and other ships that can take the bridge that they are able to provide. They're one of they're also one of two ships in the game that can bridge other ships. It's Black Ops battleships and Titans. Black Ops battleships are restricted to things that can fit a covert ops cloak. Titans are not. That's the difference. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that Black Ops battleships cannot fit a covert ops cloak. So if they want to warp somewhere, they have to decloak and warp. So you have a chance to actually find them as they land. But you have to do it very quickly after they land. Because they are actually faster with the cloak turned on than with it turned off, assuming that they have trained their skills up enough. Any other questions? So, um, every time, like, a cloaky camper like Sino to get one of our riding ships, there would be, like, a Black Ops somewhere on the um, enemy hey, system that exactly. just dumps them all. Exactly. There, every time that a Sino gets lit and we get hot dropped by a block group, there is a battleship sitting somewhere in another system, either on a structure or at a deep safe somewhere. They decloak, activate the bridge, the rest of the fleet jumps through, and at least with our group, our, uh, Braves group, a lot of the times the Black Ops will jump through as well if you're just out hunting. If you're shooting structures, normally no. But if you're just out having fun, normally the blobs will jump through as well, get in on the fun, and absolutely tear some shit up. I personally spent about seven and a half billion isk on my redeemer between the pit and the pod. That that's how fun they can be that you want to spend that kind of money just to make it that little bit better. You know what I mean? Any other questions about the Black Ops or any other subcap before I move on? Okay. Guess it's time we get to the big toys. So, first big toy we're going to talk about is carriers. So, these ships, in and of themselves, don't actually mount any weapon. A carrier, if you just undocked it without loading things into it, is basically useless. It's just a sponge. It can soak up a bunch of damage. What makes a carrier dangerous is fighters, uh, which are basically drones on steroids. Big boy drones. Um, so the only real way to counter a carrier, if you run into one of them, you have enough damage on your side you can actually shoot their fighters instead of shooting them. And that will allow you to basically burn through their fighters and then start focusing on their ship instead now that they can't kill any of your ships. Uh, another thing to keep in mind with carriers, 
they have a special module called a network sensor array that actually allows them to have lock things a lot faster than any other sh capital ship can. Uh, next capital, oh, actually, any questions about carriers before I go on? Okay. Uh, next thing we're going to cover is dreadnoughts. And so there are two, technically there's a whole mix of ways. But in terms of the guns, there are two ways you can fit a dreadnought. You can fit it up for anti-capital or for anti-sub-capital guns. Uh, the anti-sub-cap guns are slightly slower on the tracking than battleship guns, but they're going to do a lot more damage, and they're going to shoot a lot further. The anti-capital guns are some of the highest damage output you can get in this game. Um, the new Triglavian one, the Zernatra, I believe actually has the highest DPS in the game once it ramps up. It gets absolutely ludicrous. Um, I've heard over 20,000 DPS. And the other thing to keep in mind with dreads is that they're like marauders. You have to push a button for them to get good. And that stops them moving. It makes them invulnerable to some things, more vulnerable to others. And their, their guns are effectively useless without being in seed. But as soon as they hit that siege module, their DPS goes through the roof. The alpha off of the guns goes through the roof. Uh, the tracking doesn't improve, unlike with Bastion. But the tank still, their capabilities to self-rep still improve massively. Uh, you can actually get Dreadnought to repair... I already threw this number around, but over 20,000 estimated hit points per second. Any other questions about Dreadnoughts before I move on? Okay, uh, next thing to cover is Faxes, Force Auxiliary Carriers. Uh, these are these are basically capital-sized logistics. So the same things that I said with regards to the logistics frigates and logistics cruisers a while ago apply. They cannot do much on their own, but if you need something to rep, this is literally the best you can get. Um, the difference between a fax and a Logi Cruiser or a Logi Frigate is that they are actually capable of repping themselves. Uh, the triage module does the same thing as Siege, with the exception that it makes repair, remote repairs more effective as opposed to guns. So the Dreadnought is guns and self-reps. The fax is remote reps and self-reps. Any questions? So they're base, they're the combat medics. They're giant capital combat medics. Exactly. Like if something is going to die no matter what, and you drop a fax on it, all of a sudden that certainty becomes a lot less certain. How much can it actually repair them? Itself or someone else? Um, someone else, I guess. 
Uh, give me just a second. Let me check. Actually, are uh, are logi chains or faxes a thing? No, there is no such thing as a cap chain for a fax because of the fact that it also has the remote repair penalty that dreadnoughts do and marauders. Uh, while the siege, or in this case triage module, is active. No one can repair you. No one can send you capacitor. But you start repairing people and sending capacitor much more efficiently than you would otherwise. Um, let's see. So I have an apostle fit that I had lying around. And... Oh, wow, this is only T1 triage. Uh, let's throw a T2 in there, get an accurate number. Okay, so a fax can throw around 12 to 1300 hit points per second per repair module that they have fit. So if, for example, you have three repair modules, that means that you can throw around 36 to 3,900 hit points per second of repairs. Any other questions? Oh, yes, uh, Hero does have a good point. Uh, faxes do actually have a drone base. They're the only capital that uses drones as opposed to fighters. And that's because they aren't supposed to really have a offensive capacity, they're defensive ship. Uh, the exception, there is a weird thing with faxes. Uh, when you're in triage, any drones except logistics drones are useless. They don't do anything. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can't launch them at all, or if they just fly around and don't shoot anything. But that does happen. The trade-off for that is that they, the triage module also buff how much your Logi drones are doing. Um, one more thing to bring up before we move on to the biggest toys in the game. Regular capitals can get tackled just like any sub-capital. Unless you have it fit up with warp core stabs, a single warp disruptor will keep them from being able to warp off or jump. However, once you get to the super capitals, the super carriers and the titans, that's no longer the case. And that is the exception that I mentioned earlier when I was asked about disruptors versus scrams versus the scripted bubble. To tackle a super capital, for example, with a super carrier, since I have the Aeon up right now, for every level that you have trained of a Mar carrier, it takes five warp disruptors to keep you from warping. So if you have a Mar carrier to five, you would have to have 25 ships using a warp disruptor on you, 13 ships using a scram. Or, technically, you could have battleships using the heavy scramblers on you, which have a higher effect. However, if you have a single hick with the script loaded, you're going nowhere. Uh, the script, do you, uh, it's 100 points against your warp core strength. Hero, I'm not covering Rorkles. 
you aren't likely to see those offensively. Uh, Titans, uh, the effect basically turned up to 10. It would take 50 ships with warp disruptors. Now, uh, with super carriers, they operate just like a regular carrier. They get the network sensor array. They, their only offensive thing that they have is the fighters. However, they get to use bigger fighters, basically. Um, super carriers are able to launch heavy fighters, which are, depending on which type you use, because there are two types, you are able to either do an absolutely ludicrous amount of damage to capital ships and structures, or you're able to do less damage to subcap. And the, the terms for that is, um, I can't remember what the anti-capital fighters are called, but the keyword to see in the attributes for the other one is long range attack. Those are actually going to be able to track subcapital ships Whereas if you try to use the anti-capital fighters, it's just going to miss almost every single time. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention, um, every single ship in the game has a 300 kilometer max targeting range built into it. It doesn't matter how many sensor boosters you throw at it, it will not be able to lock past 300 kilometers because it's a game mechanic. The one exception to that is carriers and super carriers. And that's mainly because they aren't what's actually shooting you. It's their fighters. It's just that they have, because of the way the game mechanics work, the ship has to lock up the target to then pass the target along to the fighters. Last type of ship combat ship in the game is titan these are the biggest most expensive ships in the game uh they basically cost as much as an entire keep star and they used to be able to fit the high angle guns to shoot subcaps like dreads did but ccp removed that capability They have an absolutely massive amount of damage potential with their regular guns if you have the skills fully trained up. If you notice, the Avatar gets a 180% bonus to its energy turret damage per level. They're also able to fit the last remaining vestige of the old link system which is the phenomena generator those are basically links modules that apply to the entire system so for example the amar one i cannot remember off the top of my head give me two seconds to pull up the stats Okay, so the Amar Phenomena Generator, for example, is going to buff the capacitor recharge rate of any ship in the system. It's going to buff the kinetic resistances of any ship in the system. It's going to make you weaker to, elect to EM weapons, like the lasers that it uses, and it slows you down a little bit. And every faction's phenomena generator is going to be different. 
you can only fit the phenomena generator that corresponds to the faction your titan is. Uh, obviously, with the uh, pirate faction titans, because yes, those are a thing, you can fit either faction's phenomena generator or doomsday to them. The other main thing that titans get used for is as I just alluded to, their doomsdays. The basic doomsday is a basically giant laser of death that can get fired once every five minutes. And it can only be used on capital sized ships. However, there are other types of doomsdays, such as the boson, the lance, and the reaper. Those are the three that can be used against subcap or multiple capital ships. Um, they're AOE weapons, but they require you to manually target them. Uh, you basically aim them relative to your own ship, and then they fire, and anyone in the path of that weapon out to where it ends will take the damage from it. Any questions about anything I've covered so far? Good. What was that, Wyvern? Did you just I accidentally said, mic up? Or? No, I said we're good. Okay. Uh, Hero, fine. I'll cover Rorkles. Um, Rorkles are basically... big souped-up versions of the Porpoise or the Orca. So they're going to be able to use drones. That's the only way that they can do any damage. Other than things like smart bombs, obviously. And they also have a siege module of their own. It's called Industrial Core. So that is going to buff their self reps. It's going to allow it actually allows them to compress ore internally. Uh, the only other way you can compress ore is to take it over to a station. Uh, by the way, Chu, you're hot miking. And they also get a bonus to drone damage while the indie core is up. Uh, the one unique thing that Rorkles get is what's called the Pulse Activated Nexus Invulnerability Core, or PANIC. Uh, basically what that does is if you are out mining and you get dropped, as long as you have a target, uh, a, a asteroid locked up, you can hit that button, and for a certain amount of time, based on your skill in using that module, your ship and any industrial ship on grid gets locked in place, but it becomes 100% invulnerable to incoming damage. It literally receives 100% resistances to its shield. So as long as you have one hit point in your shield, you can't take damage. Any questions? Yes, Hero has a really good point. Um, they're actually really good at tackling capitals uh, because they can fit the heavy scrams and heavy 
warp disruptors that I alluded to earlier when we were talking about Battleship. Okay. So there's one more set of things I wanted to go through, and this one's going to be a lot faster. So I know that people say that stereotypes are bad. In EVE, they're really good. It allows you to quickly evaluate what type of weapons a ship will be using, what type of tank it will have, and how fast and maneuverable it will be. So with Amarian ships, there are two different weapon types that will be used almost exclusively. Lasers, uh, pulsed and beam lasers. Uh, and the thing about lasers, uh, based on which crystal you load in, which is your ammo, it will define what range you can fire to and how much damage you can do with an inverse proportionality. So the shorter the range, the higher the damage, the longer the range, the lower the damage. The other weapon type is drone. So those are going to be, you, you launch them, and as long as the target is within your drone control range, you click F to pay respect as they start dying. Because that's the shortcut for your drones. Amar ships are also going to have an armor tank. So you're typically going to get a very high amount of EHP on an Amar ship. Because armor tanks do tend to cap higher than shield does. But it slows your ship down. And any reps you receive from yourself or from your Lodgy are going to land at the end of the cycle, which means that you have more time to hit someone before they can get repaired and it becomes impossible to kill them. One other major aspect of armor tanks most of the hardeners for them are passive as in they don't require cap you put them on the ship you put them online and they just work uh one of the exceptions for that is a module called the reactive armor hardener what that does is every cycle it analyzes how much damage you've taken to your armor. And then it goes and adjusts its resistance profile. So that way, using that same ratio of damage that you took, it will add up to 60% resistance that it's adding to whatever needs it. So for example, if I get shot up with explosive missiles and I leave the reactive armor hardener running because if you shut it off, it resets. And I go and start running a Blood Raider site instead, I'll start off with 60% explosive resistance that that thing is giving me. But then as I run the site, that 60% explosive will shrink to zero and all of a sudden I'll have let's say 40% EM resistance and 20% thermal because all the resistances have to add up to 60. That's the most it can give you. And that's one of the really nice things that you can get with an armor tank is that specific module. Uh, the other faction that uses armor as its primary tank is Galente. So all the same things apply, except, oop, yep, uh, I'm working on it, hero. 
I had to actually open my stream, so. Anyways, I can keep talking while I do this. Wait, what? Anyways, so Galente ships will typically be faster than a Mars ships. They have less of a penalty to their mobility due to the armor. Other than that, the tank is going to be the same. Now, in terms of the weapons that Galente used, They also use drones, just like Amar does, but with a much higher There we go, I found the button. Haha. <laughs> uh with a much higher effectiveness than Amar does. The other option that they have is hybrid weapons. So that's gonna be blasters and railguns. Blasters are gonna be basically the highest damage weapons in the game, but they're also at the shortest range. Railguns, on the flip side, are some of the lowest damage, but also some of the longest range. Uh, they're going to be locked to their damage type. They're going to do kinetic and thermal only, just like lasers only do EM and thermal. Uh, the other thing to bring up with Galente ships, they are very good with structure or hull tanking. Uh, the most conspicuous ship for that is the Brutix Navy issue. These things can get like 80, 90,000 EHP without sacrificing any of their mid slots without sacrificing any of their speed and because they have blasters and they still have that speed the fact that they're losing some low slots that they could be using to buff their damage doesn't matter anymore moving on to the next faction. Uh, we've got our Kaldari ships here. All of them are going to be set up for a shield tank. So that means that you are going to have slightly less in terms of your maximum EHP. Although you do get more shield hit points on average with a Kaldari ship than you do with a Minmatar ship. There are some downside shields. Uh, first of all, most shield modules will cause your signature radius to increase. It, it's referred to as bloom, typically. Sig bloom. So every shield extender you put on your ship your ship becomes a little bit easier to lock. Every harder that you put on your ship, it becomes a little bit easier to lock. Another vulnerability of shields is that they use active hardeners predominantly, unlike armor with the passive ones. So if you run out of capacitor, all of a sudden you're out of your shield, your tank drops massively 
because you no longer have a module providing resistance. It requires the capacitor to operate. You're also going. So once you get below 25%, uh, there is a skill that mitigates this. But assuming you haven't trained it, you'll start to take armor damage as well as shield damage at that point. In terms of the weapons they use, uh, Kaldari specialize in missiles predominantly. So it allows you to pick what damage type you want, unlike hybrid lasers and to some extent projectiles. But there's no way to change the range that the missile will fire without changing the actual module that's on your ship. You can't just swap the ammo to extend the range like you can with other weapons. You can fire a shorter distance, no issue, but you aren't going to get a boost the amount of damage you're doing. And you cannot shoot past the maximum range no matter what. So you effectively have nothing past that point. Uh, some Kaldari ships will also use hybrids. So you, blasters and railguns, already talked about those. Last faction we haven't talked about is Minmatar. Uh, they're predominantly going to use shields, but there are some that are actual, some in the power ships that are actually designed to use armor. They're a bit weird like that. And for their weapons, they, they use projectile weapons mostly. There are a few missile boats, but it's mostly projectiles. So projectiles if you look at just the optimal range, are relatively short ranged. Uh, auto cannons have about the same, like fairly longer range for optimal than blasters. And projectiles don't have an optimal anywhere near as long, <laughs> as far away as railguns do. But they have an absolutely ludicrous fall off. Uh, what that is, in case you don't know, fall off is the point at which your guns are doing half the damage that they would if they're optimal. Uh, so auto cannons are short range with better fall off than most and really good tracking. Artillery don't track as well, but they shoot a lot further. Uh, the other main thing to keep in mind with Minmatar, on average, Minmatar ships are going to be the fastest Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, that actually covers everything I had been wanting to talk to you guys about. So thanks for sticking with me. I know it took a little while. Enjoy the rest of your nights. Have a good one.